So, uh, this is a, uh, rather unprecedented moment, I'd say, for the channel. It's a face reveal, I suppose, but, eh, it was about to happen at some point. But I want to preface this by saying, hey, I'm still doing content. In fact, I got a lot of stuff recorded for the Devil May Cry 4 Let's Play. That's still ongoing. Though I will say... <sighs> That's pretty good. But anyway, I will say definitely for Devil May Cry 4, I have a lot of parts I still haven't recorded. Like, I recorded some parts back in fall, the first two parts, which are currently up on YouTube. They are, you can kind of tell that these are recorded way back in like September, October, I don't remember when, it was like roughly around that, but anyway, that's besides the point. And I had some parts recorded way back in January and February that I meant to upload back then, but I just never got around to it. It's just part of it's because I have to actually render the videos to make sure the audio is right, which if you've seen the Okage Let's Play, you kind of know the audio has been a bit tricky here and there. But I got a new microphone now, so it's a lot better now. You can kind of tell Devil May Cry 1 and 4's Let's Plays that the audio improved. And that's because now I take the time to make sure the audio is properly mastered. And uh, I am pretty far... I would say at the ha I'm at the halfway point, essentially, for Devil May Cry 4. So I should probably get back to that. It should be probably finished, I'd say, by pretty much the end of April at the latest. Though it should be finished before then. But anyway... I will definitely say, once it gets to the halfway point though, I'm going to say almost every part from then on will be solo, and you're probably not going to guess why, you're probably going to guess why, because right now, we are in the middle of a pandemic at the moment. Uh, the COVID-19, if you will, which has swept practically almost every continent except for Antarctica. And I kind of wanted to make this as a way to simply address this before we get to the top 10 list, because I've been working on this for a little while. But anyway, I just want to say, uh, do the best you can. Like, wash your hands frequently. Don't touch your face out in public. And if you only go out if you ever, ever need stuff. Like, if you ever just need actual stuff. Like, you have no food at the house, no soap or anything like that. And also, for the love of God, please... Please do not panic by toilet paper, like, because that's just depriving people that actually need toilet paper. Like, I can understand, you know, having food and all. Definitely, that's completely understandable. And definitely, I will say that this is some crazy times we live in for now. But all I can definitely say is, right now, do the best you can. Don't panic. We're all in this together. And I personally feel like if we do this right, we'll be back to normal by practically the summer. Yeah, assuming everything goes to plan. I mean, I know everything's going a little crazy right now, but trust us, we'll get through it. And also, I also want to talk about the poll, since I don't think I'll be addressing this for a little while, but like, the poll I did back in February to determine my next Let's Play has also been decided. The game I'll be playing next is Driver, You Are the Wheelman for the original PlayStation. Which, this game was really good, and I do hope, I think it will be a really good Let's Play. I personally feel like that this is a going to be a really good one, and I'm surprised this one actually won the poll, honestly, considering that this is a series that's kind of forgotten about, essentially. But anyway, that's besides the point. I think I know what you guys are really here for, so... Fighting game bosses. They're big, they're bad, and they're cheap as hell. Let's get on to the countdown. It's no secret that I do enjoy a good fighting game from time to time, and they can provide a fun single-player experience on the occasion. However, one thing that can easily ruin that is the bosses. Most of the time, the average boss is just made hard to sap all of your quarters away for the sake of a challenge and for profiting arcade owners. Today, we're going to look at 10 of the hardest bosses i fought. I do have some rules I want to lay out first. Rule number one, one game per franchise. If there's a harder boss from another game that you feel should have been on this list, either I didn't find them as hard, or I haven't played that specific game in question. Rule number two, no optional bosses. If the boss is mandatory to fight for an ending, then they'll count, like if it's Mukai from The King of Fighters 2003. If they're just a mere bonus boss that doesn't change too much like Akuma in Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo, then he doesn't count, since if you either beat Bison or Akuma in Super Turbo, you still get your ending either way, the only difference is that you beat Akuma for bragging points. 
Overall number three, I also have to have played the game in question and fought the boss myself. So sorry, the general from Kaiser Knuckle will not be on this list. I have not played that game in question. With that out of the way, let's dive into some grade A bullshit. Let's get this out of the way. Third Strike is arguably my favorite fighter of all time, with its technical depth and really fun gameplay. However, there is one thing I could feel this game could probably do without, and that would be Gil. The mark of my dignity shall scar thy DNA. I know a lot of people hated Seth from Street Fighter 4, but if you ask me, Seth is child's play compared to Gil. Gil is the leader of the Illuminati and sees himself as humanity's god. And let me just say, he definitely has the power to back up that boast. His projectiles deal 3 hits worth of damage and will have priority over your projectiles. His dash can actually really allow him to cover faster range, and it will take priority over whatever attacks you do. So... Be very careful and keep your guard up if he assigns the dash. He also has a really good anti-air that it also can be a good overhead, so crouch blocks aren't going to work well on it. And whatever damage he deals, his normals deal absurd amounts of damage, and they also have ridiculous amounts of stun as well, so he'll immediately dizzy you. But that's nothing compared to his supers. His first super, Meteor Shower, is pure bullet hell. It says a lot that this is his least threatening super. His second super, Seraphic Wing, is a full screen super, a first for Street Fighter, that deals at least a quarter of chip damage, and if you're not blocking it, you may as well already be dead. But his final super is by far the most terrifying ability, and it's not even an attack. Most Street Fighter fans dread hearing this specific phrase. Yeah, that's right, if you manage to KO him, but his super meter is full, he'll immediately revive himself from death. Granted, you can interrupt it to prevent a full heal, but that's easier said than done, as the resurrection pushes you far back enough, and will eliminate any current projectiles. The only saving grace is that if he uses a resurrection, it shuts off the super meter for the rest of the fight, but by that point, you may as well have a few hits left before KO. Bottom line, fuck Gil. If you do lose to him enough times, however, the difficulty may be lowered, and you'll notice it by the taunt, but honestly, in my footage, I actually did not actually get anything of him taunting, so I'm not sure if it's in the arcade version, or I just simply got lucky enough to beat him before the AI decided, hey, we're gonna go easy on you, because you probably fucking suck. Before I get to this boss I want to cover, I just want to say I'm surprised that I've never gotten around to covering Tekken on this channel, considering it's one of my favorite fighting series. Now with that out of the way, Tekken as a series has never really had any pure bullshit bosses per se. Yeah, some bosses like Heihachi or Kazuya or Devil Kazuya in the first two games may be a little tough, but they're perfectly beatable and are outright cheap. Just a little tricky. If you know your characters, you can beat them. I don't think the same can be said for Jinpachi Mishima in Tekken 5. Jinpachi may seem like he doesn't have much, as once you unlock him in the PS3 port of Dark Resurrection, he only has like 10 moves, which is a bit paltry compared to the dictionaries of moves that the rest of the cast has. But trust me, there is a damn good reason he only has 10 moves. It's all he frickin' needs. His launcher deals a good chunk of health, and he can combo into it three times for a third of your health bar. He has a fireball that comes out immediately, it's unblockable, and deals at least two-thirds worth of damage of your health. Yeah, you could argue that bosses like Devil or True Ogre also had unblockable projectiles, but those dudes had like three seconds of wind-up, giving you ample time to either sidestep out of the way, or just run behind them and punish them. He can also combo to this projectile as well, which means if you're in hit stun, you're fucked. 
He also has super armor during this fireball as well, so you can't just simply punch him out of it. So sidestep or die. His AI is also a button reading bastard. Get used to it, this is gonna be a trend with a few of these bosses. And will punish you with a combo that takes half of your health with one with one whiff that goes bad. He can also phase in and out of the battlefield, similar to Akuma, granting him insane mobility for a 3D fighter, though it's tame compared to a flat-out teleport. It speaks volumes that this dude was never playable in the console ports of Tekken 5 until the Dark Resurrection port on PS3, and even then he was also banned from tournaments, which is a distinction that most Tekken bosses never had. They had to remake his move list from the ground up just to have him be balanced in Tekken Tag 2 as a legit fighter. You win. Gotcha! Now, when Dead or Alive remembers it's a fighting game, it can be pretty fun, though it also has its fair share of annoying bosses. Tengu, I would argue, is one notorious son of a bitch, but I feel that one other boss really takes the cake, and that would be Alpha 152. Alpha 152's AI is completely omniscient and will abuse counters all she wants. Her combo strings are stupidly crazy, easily going into the 10 hit range, and will take at least a third of your health. However, there's one thing that outright puts her in a major bastardry. It what's a 3D fighter focused on hand-to-hand -hand combat is that she has a teleport that she will abuse without restraint. You thought Jinpachi's phasing was bad. No, this is worse. She will teleport herself out of your combos and to counter your own combos. Her arena also has several danger zones, which will deal extra damage to you if Alpha knocks you into them or uses a throw onto one of the danger zones. Her AI is also really good at baiting you out, as if you make one mistake, say goodbye. It really says a lot in order for her to become a balanced character in Dead or Alive 5. The only way they could make that work was that they had to split her moveset into two separate characters, where Phase 4 got her teleports and Alpha got the combo strings, though thankfully their damage is hella nerfed. Also, unlike Dead or Alive 2, where Tengu wasn't the boss of Time Attack Mode, Alpha is, and I know someone's gonna say, but time attack mode isn't really an essential part of fighting games, you can really ignore that. And, for the most part, I'd argue that's true. Except for the fact that in Dead or Alive 4, in order to unlock the Tengu, you have to beat the time attack mode with everybody alongside everyone's arcade modes. Which means, you're gonna have to fight Alpha with everybody at some point. And some characters have the worst time. Good luck using characters like Bass against her. In fact, take a look at this timesheet right here and notice how long it took me to beat Alpha compared to other fights. And what do you get when you beat Alpha with some characters? Well, you get an ending that, for the most part, for most characters, are complete nonsense like this. It's Onslaught, baby! This was a cut and dry case for me, since while most bosses in the series are powerful, they're also giant, slow, and bulky, which makes most of their attacks predictable and very easy to punish. The same cannot be said for Onslaught in Marvel vs. Capcom. Onslaught is the unholy fusion of Professor X alongside Magneto's philosophy and powers, which ends up granting the most powerful telepath 
Magnetos control the electromagnetic spectrum. That already sounds scary, but he also has ass loads of super armor, which means he can tank almost every attack, including supers, which he may just simply teleport out of even. His damage is also absurd, and if you're careless, he will kill one of your characters within five seconds. He will sometimes call out sentinels to assist him for combos, which is notable since the sentinel requires a code to select even as an assist in the actual game. It will never pop up with a random roulette ever, you have to use the specific code. He will also on occasion run away like a little bitch and summon a clone of a random character in the roster to fight for him while he regains his health. And if you think it's over when you KO him, think again. He has a second form that's slightly easier, but at that point you're probably down to your last character and with very little health left. He'll spam magnetic shockwaves, which deal tremendous amounts of damage. He'll also try to rush you down with his mighty hand, which hits like a semi-truck. What's worst of all is that he'll also use the hypergraph to try to temporarily immobilize you, then he'll immediately combo you with one of those. The one saving grace at this point is that his final form is a glass cannon, so if you can dodge them all, you can KO him, but it will take a lot of perseverance. Now we're going into early SNK boss territory. Say what you will about M. Bison in Street Fighter 2, but when you figure out how he fights, you can probably beat him with no issue. Geese Howard, on the other hand, is pure trouble. His Rapukin will shred through your health bar like butter and he will counter in almost any jump in or attack with his infamous counter grab. Predictable! Which he will abuse nilly willy. He can also just counter in near approaches as if you just jump into him, which is kind of bullshit. Come on, man, this isn't fair! His AI is also a blatant block whore, which combined with his counter grab gives him a nearly impenetrable defense, and can also make nearly approaching him difficult. He also will ignore the lane system rules, and will freely travel between planes. Which was not even possible till Fatal Fury 2 onwards, as the only way to travel between planes in Fatal Fury is if you knock someone into the other plane, and then you push the kick buttons. You can't just freely jump in and out. He also has an exclusive continue screen if you lose him. Get used to seeing this a lot, as he will frequently kick your ass. Luckily, he's vulnerable to a similar glitch that affects everybody. Every time on the first frame, he's vulnerable on the first frame of him standing up. So if you can find a time to punish him, give him trouble. And let me just say, the end result is quite worth it. The only reason Motaro did not make this list is one, he's a sub-boss, so automatically he was disqualified to make the list, and also, you can easily screw up his AI, and in games like Mortal Kombat Trilogy, they actually nerfed his attack reflector, so you can kind of freeze, spear, whatever him. However, I don't think the same could be said for Shao Kahn. Shao Kahn in general is a bastard in almost all of his appearances, but I believe personally that his incarnation of Mortal Kombat 3 and its many updates are his hardest ones yet. First off, a fair amount of his moves take priority over whatever moves you do. They can also leave you with a severe amount of hit stun, which leaves you even more vulnerable for his combos. Second, this dude has a fireball that he loves to spam that comes out immediately and will take a good chunk of your health. Did I also mention this is an unblockable? Third, his health is absurd when where irregular hits barely deal any damage, which is notable since most early Mortal Kombat games never really had a defense stat, unlike its Japanese fighting game Brethren. Finally, when he decides that he's getting his mallet, he will immediately dizzy you if you get hit by it, and he'll deal an absurd amount of damage again. Haven't I said that plenty of times already? He also loves to use his shoulder charge, which he also has an anti-air variant, and yes, he can combo into that with no issue. 
His AI is typical Mortal Kombat fare, which means perfect play up the ass with supercomputer reaction times and blocks, and will wail on you if you make one mistake. The big saving grace is that he will taunt on the occasion, though from my personal experience, he taunts the least in Mortal Kombat 3. Also, unlike Motaro, he does not at least have a projectile immunity, though that's assuming you'll have enough of a free shot at to hit him. Oh, come here! Welcome to die, alright. More like prepare to fucking die, as this incarnation of Magneto is easily, easily his cheapest yet in fighting game form. Now, one familiar with games like Marvel vs. Capcom 2 would probably be asking yourself, How the hell is this bastard cheaper than he already is? This guy has like a million infinites. Answer, his AI is a freaking coward. He will fly away like a little bitch and will try to cowardly snipe you with a projectile that will take priority over anything you can throw at him. The only characters that will probably be able to get easily in range are characters like Storm or Sentinel since they can fly as well, but it requires meter for them. And no, the second he decides to... The fight will immediately become even worse, as he has the capability to fight back. His combos are frickin' absurd, and his EM Disruptor can deal massive damage. He has another projectile that easily shuts down approaches due to how good its range is, it can cover several different directions, and can pre-create a slight bullet hell. He also can summon himself a force field that allow him to tank any damage, and shrug off damage like nothing. Yes, including his supers like the Berserker Barrage. His supers will come out of nowhere and can be the Magnetic Shockwave, which is a series of damaging pillars that can destroy any projectiles and will deal damage to at least one third of your health. Another ability isn't technically his super as it's a normal attack, and doesn't really take from his super, but it can only happen in a specific situation when he's near the, the X-Men ship, the Blackbird, where he'll take a bunch of scraps from the Blackbird and will try to drop them on you. If it hits you, you're screwed. His super meter also fills up automatically, so he'll always have a magnetic shockwave ready to bust out. Be careful, or else the Master of Magnet will make you his bitch. And let me just say, Juggernaut was already a boss before him. Keep in mind that it's not the Juggernaut that's gonna make you his bitch, it's Magneto. Ask most people about Guilty Gear Hard Bosses, and most people may mention Ido from XX, and personally, I would not blame you. Her AI is a little crazy, and her boss exclusive attack can be punishing towards newcomers, but I think it can be dodged when you know what you're doing. Personally, she doesn't even come close to the amount of bullshit that is justice from the first game. Let's get this out of the way. The original Guilty Gear is kinda whack, but justice accentuates that. You know that circular laser move she has as a super at XX onwards? Well, that's a normal move she can spam without prejudice. Justice has the speed of Chip Zenoff, the combos of Soul Bad Guy, and the strength and defense of Potemkin. Justice's AI is inhumanly fast, and it will be a major block whore, and if you manage to stun her, she'll immediately break out of it. Her supers deal at least a quarter of damage when you're blocking, and if it actually hits you, it's a guaranteed stun, which Justice may spam the super AGAIN if her health is below 50% due to Guilty Gear 1's mechanic sparring from Fatal Fury. 
Oh, and don't even think about using the original game's broken instant kill mechanic. She'll probably end up dodging your instant kill without effort, and if you're really unlucky, she'll probably encounter you with her own instant kill. Luckily, I was able to dodge hers in the recording of this footage, but if she got that instant kill off, she would have won the fight even if I had took a round on here because instant kills in the first Guilty Gear are broken as hell. That's why they're nerfed so badly in X onwards. Also, I do at least have to say this about Justice, the music in the fight is awesome, so while it is a bullshit fight, it's also bizarrely epic at the same time. And honestly, hey, if you're gonna go be bullshit, have some awesome heavy metal and it can make one kinda cool fight, though a little bullshit. Oh boy, I have a lot to say about this one. Because we're going into the King of Fighters now. Now, if anyone isn't that familiar with the King of Fighters, it's a really cool series by SNK. That's practically their street fighter. Like, it's their big fighting franchise. And one notable element of the series is its bosses. SNK Boss Syndrome is particularly notable within the King of Fighters series, because almost every boss, except I think two, are notoriously bullshit. Like, you got people like Rugal Bernstein, who's infamous for being the boss to beat all bosses. However, I was thinking two other bosses were originally going to make the list until I really started jotting this list down seriously. Originally, Gainitz was the first one I was really considering, because a lot of his attacks are straight up bullshit. His Yodokazi you can't really dodge, but Gainitz has a few things that can screw up his AI. The other one I was considering was Ignis, because he's Ignis, but there was one boss that made Ignis look like Glass fucking Joe. That boss is Magaki from the King of Fighters 11. Why, you may just ask. Let me just say, oh my god, this boss redefines the concept of SNK boss syndrome. Magaki just loves to whore out projectiles, and it turns the game into a fucking bullet hell shooter. And now you're probably wondering, that doesn't sound a lot of fun. Yeah, it isn't. It fucking sucks. He also has teleporting projectiles, invisible projectiles, an explosion attack that allows him to shake you off him that has priority over most of your attacks, and it can also reflect projectiles too! He also has the power to turn invisible, though thankfully it does not disable his hitbox, but it makes it harder to actually find the fucker. And he also has a scream filling super attack. Not only that, but his AI is far from stupid. The only real safe way, I think, is to get him into the corner, and even that isn't really a guarantee. And just getting him in the corner is far easier said than done. Approaching him is the biggest challenge, as rolling and jumps won't really help you against a barrage of projectiles, as one will inevitably hit you. He honestly feels like a major luck-based mission to beat him without using any of the mercy options from the continue screen, and even those help out tangentially. And, like, it's like this boss is the fucking President's Run mission and driver. Man, I can't believe I'm making that kind of reference in this list. However, he at least only has one health bar, and unlike other KOF games due to Eleven's team system being tag-based, he will not regain health back when he KOs a teammate. Let me just say, there's a reason this guy isn't number one, and it's because there's continues. Like, let me just say, as bad as Magaki sounds, he's far from the worst boss on the list. He was only- I only could regrettably make him number two because... The next guy. Oh boy! Do I have a lot to say about him? You win! Okay! Alright, we're at my PS2 collection here. Let's take out 11 real quick since there's something I also want to talk about since we're on the to topic of Bagaki. Like, as you will notice, 
most video games have, you know, screenshots on the back of the box. And guess what's the first screenshot you see? Yep, that's right, that's a screen filling super attack. Why they chose this as a screenshot to advertise potential buyers of the game, like this in particular, I honestly can't tell you why. It's just, it's something bizarre I thought about and just found something really interesting. But just something I thought I wanted to talk about real quick since while we're on the topic of Bagaki, this just felt like an interesting omen of things to come, pretty much. Anyway, let's get on with the rest of this list. Now then, let's recap real quick of the bullshit that we fought before we get to the number one. Number 10, Kill Valentine. Number 9, Jinzuya Hachi Mishima. Number 8, Excuse to have Naked Kasumi. Number 7, Magneto X. Number 6, Untitled Goose Howard. Number 5, Rejected He-Man Villain. Number 4, Mag Fucking Nito. Number 3, And Justice for All. Number 2, That Pink Bastard. And now finally, last but sure as hell, certainly not least, Number 1. We've talked about a lot of the notorious bosses on this list, like Magaki, Magneto, and even Gil. However, I feel like this one boss I'm about to talk about can collectively kick all of their asses with one hand tying behind his back. And there's a reason for that. With most of these other bosses, you have some ways to even the odds, like either you just have to knock them out once, or you have a team of three, or... You have a you have to knock them out in a best two to, out of three, or you also have this little mundane object called continues. You know you can continue the fight where unless you're playing stuff like the old Mortal Kombat's like on the home consoles or you have credits, you at least have a fighting chance. Well, the Eternal Champion would like to turn all of that on its head. This game is already hard enough as it is with its Mortal Kombat AI and uh, having you redo fights if you don't finish off your opponent with a stage fatality. However, once you get to the Eternal Champion, all fucking bets are off. His AI is relentless and he will pursue you without hesitation. He also has unlimited inner strength. For those that don't know, inner strength is a mechanic in Eternal Champions that's shown with this little yin yang symbol near your health meter. You need to use inner strength to perform special moves. It's kind of like Art of Fighting's Spirit Meter. However, there's one little, tiny little problem. This guy has a limitless supply of inner strength, so he can simply spam his moves whenever he wants, and he will frequently taunt you to lower your inner strength. Not that it matters since he'll block all your frickin' moves anyway. He's also a major block core. Did I also mention that this guy has five forms? His first form is the easiest, but that's not saying much, as here he has a move where he can turn himself into five orbs and then he sends them out as projectiles to stop your approach. Which, thankfully, it's telegraphed so you can block it or just simply dodge it. However, his other special is turning himself invisible, which unlike other fighting game characters like Reptile or the aforementioned Makaki, when he turns invisible, it also disables his hitbox, which means blocking is your best bet, but if he busts out a throw, which at this point in time, Throw attacking was still a little ways of being invented as Super Turbo would come out the next year. Well, he'll bust through your defenses. And also, he has no cooldown with the invisibility, so if you think, oh, I'll just wait till it runs out, then dive kick him, he'll turn himself invisible again, and again, and again. Once you knock him down, he'll access one of four random forms based on the style of these animals shark, hawk, tiger, or dragon. With dragon, he gains the ability to use projectiles to, again, so now he can camp you out. And due to how Eternal Champion also has moves that can utilize buffs and debuffs like in RPGs, he can buff his speed, defense, and attack to absurd levels. With his Hawk form, he gains a cartwheel with absurd priority which can shut down jump-ins, and he also has the ability to levitate. It also gives him this Psycho Crusher for added pressure, and he can also manipulate gusts of wind to blow you away to prevent you from closing in the gap. Yeah, he's cheap like that. Then there's his Shark form, which gives him this bubble that will stun you if it hits you. And if that's not bad enough, he also has access to this Rapukin style attack where he becomes a shark fin and will swim back and forth, back and forth, where your best bet to, do, to dodge it is to jump. Blocking it is kind of possible but tricky, and it will deal lots of damage if it hits, obviously. 
This all pales in comparison to his tiger form, which is easily his hardest form yet, where he's always aggressively attacking you with buffs to his attack and speed. Worst of all, if you lose one round of him, the fight resets to his first form. Yep, all the way back to his first form, and you gotta do it all in one go. And by one go, I literally beat it. If you lose to this guy, you do not get a chance to continue. You just straight up get the bad ending and you have to start all over. Do you want me to change the future or not, asshole? Yeah, this guy is really cheap. I said it. He's the cheapest boss ever. I'm surprised that no one ever talks about this guy, because like how straight up blatantly this guy breaks the rules to his own game. Like, seriously. Like, let's seriously talk about the other bosses. Like, Shao Kahn, at least he'll taunt on the occasion. Like, with Magaki, at least you have continue services. With, uh, with Gil, if you continue enough times, the AI will lower itself. I mean... There's a lot of other things that make these bosses intentionally easier without bugging out their AI. Eternal Champion, on the other hand, not only do you have this game where you can't really just simply continue through the ladder just to fight this guy, but also if you lose to him, you actually have to start the whole game over. Like, what kind of twisted bullshit is this? Like, I mean, I know someone's gonna bring up characters like Omega Rugal from King of Fighters 2002 Ultimate Match, but the thing with him, he was a bonus fight! You have to, like, go out of your way to fight him! Meaning that, like, at least that's a bonus fight. That's just, like, you have to go out of your way to fight him. Like, Eternal Champion, you're required to fight him. You, what do you get when you beat him? Just a text scroll ending. I mean, I know that this is the 1990s and you're not gonna get stuff like FMVs, but come on, like, Street Fighter 2 at least gave you more meaningful rewards when you beat the game, where it had, like, little comic book-style pictures, or Mortal Kombat, you had the still images when you beat the arcade modes. But this is just lazy, like, all that effort, and you might as well just simply tack in, YOU WIN! Seriously, fuck this boss, this guy makes Magaki look like Glass fucking Joe. Now, you may be asking yourselves at the end of this why I ended each boss with them getting KO'd. And to tell you the truth, it was an idea I came up with when I was recording the footage and I got a few of the KOs, since Geese was one of the first ones I recorded, and we all know that Geese ends with him famously falling off Geese Tower. And I thought to myself, let's try to get every boss knocked out, mainly because it allows me to send a message that there is no boss that can't be beaten. Even those that are bullshit like Magaki or the Eternal Champion, they could still be beatable with a lot of perseverance, and even though I would argue that Eternal Champion's reward for beating the game is kinda shitty given what you had at the time, most of the time, the rewards for beating a boss in most of these fighting games are generally worth it as the endings can either be unintentionally hilarious due to advancements in technology, such as with the old Tekken games, or most of the time you get a cool ending that sheds light on your character's background. Especially if they are a character that has a mystery, an air of mystery around them. And in some cases, it's just cool to actually beat some of these bosses, because in canon, they're sometimes the most powerful things out there, so it gives you an idea of, holy crap, I just beat him. Now then, I believe that ends this list, so let's roll the credits now and watch these bosses get KO'd once again, in case you just want to see it happen again, because let's just say, 
Nothing is more satisfying than seeing these bastards fall. Did you agree with my list? And if you also like it, feel free to like, comment, and subscribe. And if you also disagree with it, feel free to point out which bosses you thought were really hard. I'm open to hear your ideas, considering, hey, difficulty is subjective after all. To you, maybe Magaki's easy, and maybe I just suck, or maybe Magneto's easier than I think he is. I mean, I'm always open to hear what you think. Everyone's experience is different after all. This is Dr. Arthur Robotic, and I hope you enjoyed this list.